However you are and whenever you are, welcome good souls to the planet. This is Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs, spinning through the cosmos thousands and thousands of miles an hour, and yet it just feels like we're sitting perfectly still. It's odd, and that's what we do on this show. We just talk about odd things that maybe aren't so odd after all. Maybe the supernatural is, is just that. Super cool, and it's natural. And we have a lot to talk about tonight. My guest, Tui Snyder, um, she's been on before. Uh, you may be familiar with Tui's work. And uh, I'm very lucky that tonight I have two hours with Tui, um, and I'm going to ask her about absolutely everything <laughs> under the sun and beyond. Um, as a friendly reminder, open lines tonight in the last half an hour. So just call in the Paranormal Radio app. That number is 855-472-5483. The Paranormal Radio app line, 85KGRA Live. And of course, you can find us streaming on Facebook on KGRA or Paranormal Radio. And on Twitter at Paranormal underscore now, you can find out updates for future shows. Um, and of course, you can go to Instagram as well, at Paranormal Now. Um, as I mentioned before, I won't be posting quite as much on YouTube as I have in the past. Um, I will be occasionally posting on uh, IGTV. And uh, it's all for a good purpose, I hope. Um, I just had a f- my first um, conversation with someone who is going to be a part of this new project that I'm working on. And so it's the first step. I'm excited. It was successful. Um, I suspect I'll be able to give you more news about it in approximately three months. I just don't want to jump the gun, um, but I don't mind teasing you here <laughs> about it right now. Um, in the news, there's some really interesting things going on. I don't know if you've heard, but uh, a Russian cosmonaut had captured possible UFO footage from the International Space Station, uh, and the astronaut is Ivan Wagner. And uh, yeah, so if you go online and check this out, it, it looks like as they're, they're rotating over the Earth, um, the Aurora Borealis is there. And then you see a series of like four or five lights kind of come in at and out. Um, I personally think that it's probably a reflection of the window, right, that he's peering out of. Maybe someone in the background, another astronaut was doing something we don't know. It's difficult to tell. It is intriguing. What I do know is that there actually is really fascinating NASA caught footage of what look like UFOs. And I've heard a number of explanations uh, for them. Uh, And there's a couple of videos that I'm just not convinced that the conventional explanations um, explain it away. So I think we'll keep our eyes on this story. It may turn out to be nothing more than a reflection, but um, what if, right? What if? Also, um, interstellar visitor Umamua uh, could still be alien technology new study hints. And this is by uh, Live Science. A mysterious interstellar object that crashed through our solar system two years ago might in fact be alien technology. That's because an alternative non-alien explanation might be fatally flawed, as a new study argues. But most scientists think the idea that we spotted alien technology in our solar system is a long shot. In 2018, a solar system ran into an object, our solar system ran into an object lost in interstellar space. I'm not sure who has lost us or the object. Uh, The object, the Umamua, seemed to be long and thin, cigar-shaped, if you remember that, and tumbling end over end. Then, close observations showed it was accelerating, as if something were pushing on it. Scientists still aren't sure why. One explanation, the object was propelled by an alien machine, uh, such as a light sail, a wide millimeter-thin machine that accelerates and pushed by solar radiation. Uh, The main proponent of this argument was Avi Loeb of Harvard University uh, astrophysicist. And um, so, yeah, it came to be that they thought they could explain away this object. Um, And once again, it reared its head. And uh, I have to wonder, I have to wonder, 
if um if this could be you know the official first contact i don't know it's fascinating so we'll, we'll continue to follow the story because it certainly will not go away and um it keeps me uh you know on my toes and interested so th- with that in mind on our toes and being interested i'm going to now bring on the one and only tui snyder tui welcome to paranormal now again hello Thanks for having me on again, Alan. How are you doing? Good, good. It's so good to see you. Um, I love your energy and <laughs> your enthusiasm. You, you, know, you, you actually seem to be publishing quite a bit lately as well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's what the pandemic brings out in me or something. Right. I've just yeah, been on fire point. lately. I actually right. just started another book kind of accidentally the other day. And I'm like, whoa, I already have about 17,000 words in. I'm like, what happened? But you know, all my speaking engagements are, are canceled. My whole calendar is clear. You know, yeah. it's not like I realized, wow, it, it does take a lot of energy going to events and everything. So I'm just pouring all that into uh, books and then uh, YouTube occasionally. I like to do a few, um, you know, I like to go out in the field and do YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. That's, and not to be morbid, but yeah. um, it's not like you have to social distance in graves and graveyards rather very much. Oh, exactly. So, I mean, oh, you can get out there and do your work. It's, it's really actually a really wonderful thing to do because I know people here, and I mentioned this in the um, introduction to my book, which it is my brand new book. I'll show you. It's Six Feet Under Texas. And uh, I mentioned that, you know, when people find out that I do a lot of um, research in historic cemeteries, they just instantly assume that, you know, I, I dress like Morticia and I'm obsessed with death, you know. And I mean, actually, I kind of like how Morticia dresses and all that. I, I'm mm-hmm. nothing against that kind of gothy look. Um, and I have like my, one of my favorite dresses is that I wear, like when I give cemetery tours, has skeletons, glow in the dark skeletons all over it. But whatever. But my point is that I think people forget that cemeteries are for the living. And they think, you know, you think because obviously that's where we put our Ted. But we really, everyone has their own idea of what happens after you die. And that's one of the fun things we love to explore with the paranormal and all the things we do. We're all trying to figure it out through Mm -hmm. religion or just our own belief system and experiences. But a cemetery, to me, really brings history to life in a way that nothing else does. Like, I hated history at school. Mm -hmm. To me, it just seemed so boring, like this battle and that government stuff. But when you're standing in a cemetery and you're looking at an individual's grave, And then you go home and do some research on them and you learn about that person. You can't help but learn some history because you have to take that person's actions in with the context of the time. So for me, cemetery history, I think, is a really good activity. Like, number one, you said, you know, no social distancing to worry about, really. Um, It's you can picnic in them. It's perfectly acceptable tradition that goes way back to ancient Greece, if not further. You know, just don't litter. And you come away with, um, it, it gives you an empathy for other times, which I don't think we always get. And I think it's important to have that empathy for other times. Like, yeah, yeah go ahead. Oh, no, absolutely. So we'll, we'll get into all that. But I, I do have to ask you, since I have you yeah. on the show, um, oh, yeah. you know, do, you, do you pay attention to news like that? Like the uh, Mua Mua um, and Alien Contact? I do. I mean, I love anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love, like, uh, yeah. Definitely. I'm not familiar with the Muamua thing, though. I was over here going, wow, that sounds kind of, um, that sounds like a Hawaiian or a Polynesian name. I I haven't seen it. I'm like, I made a note of it. I'm taking notes while we talk, so I, things I will look up later. But that, to me, is really fascinating. And do you know what that means? What does Muamua mean? You know, I don't know what the meaning is off, offhand. I know um, Carol Carl, who's on the show and discussed it, if she's listening, she would probably know. Um, so there is a grave that could potentially be an alien oh yeah <laughs> oh boy yeah that one we have we have to start there yeah definitely i was like oh we're definitely got to get into that one in fact since you know i'm writing so many books i i gave a talk about this last year at the international ufo congress mm-hmm. and it's about the book that i'm working on and of course i now of course i'm writing a book because um Well, let me back up a little. I've lived in Texas since 2009, Mm -hmm. and I moved here because, um, you know, I I, I came here because of a man, (laughs) basically. Okay. (laughs) And now we're married, and, you know, it'll be our 10th wedding anniversary next year. So Uh I'm not, I haven't lived in Texas my whole life. Mm -hmm. And 
but you know, as a writer, when people, people probably do this to you since they find out you have a radio show, they probably say, Oh, you know what you should be doing and you know, do a show about knitting or something that's not even related. Kind of, you know, yeah. it's just like, well, you love knitting. Why don't you do that? So I get that a lot. I love people and I, I do learn a lot from my readers. Like I get really good suggestions from them. And, mm-hmm. um, but you know, when, when I first meet someone, you know, at a potluck or something and, and they just, Oh, you're a writer. And they say, you know what you should write about? I kind of, I brace myself because quite often it's like, you know, you should write a book about this apple I saw one, you know, it's something like, I'm like, I don't know. So anyway, in about 2012 or something, this guy came up to me at, at a, some social gathering and he just was like, you know what? Um, you know, you're a writer, you know what you should write about? And I'm like, oh boy, here we go. You know, take another bite of food. And he just goes, um, you should write about that, that little space alien they buried down the road away. I'm like, what? I thought he was pulling my leg. Yeah. But he goes, no, no, go home and look it up. So of course I look it up and I find out that about 20 miles or 20 minutes away from me in the little town of Aurora, mm-hmm. which has got about a population of 400 in their cemetery, which has got a population <laughs> of about, you know, 2,000, right. um, there is a little grave off by itself that um, at the time I saw it, it, uh, well, I wonder if I can show you. I, oh, there you are. Hey, you've got the photos. Wow, well, look at that. That's how it looks now. Now, when I first saw it, um, it had a little carved uh, cigar-shaped craft on it with like little portholes. And I was like, holy moly, this is a real event. I mean, at least something happened here to warrant putting a headstone. It, 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 wow. So yeah. I, I, I went home and I decided to do some research. And I do a lot of my research. Um, I do a lot of uh, uh, newspaper research. And, you know, because no one's alive from 1897. <laughs> and so I, I went into some newspaper archives and there's a bunch that I belong to and know about so that I just dig into. And I thought, okay, I typed in airship 1897. Mm-hmm. I, th- I was shocked. Um, hundreds of sightings of airships took place in North right. Texas at the time. See, I did not know that. I thought this was a one-off, this little thing. I grew up, the only alien body I knew about was Roswell. Well, that's mm-hmm. 50 years later. You know, in 1897, the biggest thing in the sky would have been a turkey vulture around here. And they're big. But so I got all so I got a little bit obsessed. At first, I thought it was ridiculous. Then I just thought, oh, whenever I would be have a little downtime, you know, working on some other project, I just would find myself looking up airships again, just kind of obsessively. And, you know, over the past eight years, now I have all these newspaper clippings and and things, and I've kind of organized them into different types of sightings. But the Mm -hmm. long and the short of it is the the one that that people can go look at, the one you showed that picture of, that happens in April of 1897. And and there people, the, the account that was in the Dallas Morning News said that the early risers of Aurora you know, we're, we're woken by a, a loud explosion when a craft lost altitude and crashed in, crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. And they discovered a little charred body in there, a small humanoid body that was, you know, quote unquote, not of this world. Right. Um, so yes, that's buried there now. So so it just fascinates me. What do you where do we go from here, right? <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, do you think that that was a completely fabricated story? Do you think it was based um, in truth? And if, it, if so, how much of it do you think could be true? You know, it, I've, I've been all over the map on how I feel about this. And mm-hmm. I've kind of gotten to the point where my goal is just, I'm really fascinated with uh, thinking what it would be like to be in 1897 because some of the accounts I've read you know some of them they're obviously making fun of it some of them are just totally ridiculous hoaxes Mm -hmm. you know some of them you know so I just but I have sections for each of that and and there was actually a tradition back in the 1800s and so hoax journalism I call it it's different now you know we it's not fake news it it was different it was meant Mm -hmm. to be entertaining and 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 they would just 
your newspaper, we didn't have all these different news sources. You didn't like have Mad Magazine or, you know, and, and like Time Magazine and Newsweek. And, you know, you, you know what you're getting with Cosmopolitan or something. You're getting a different type of news with each of those. You know, the, if you go to the store and you grab the Inquirer, you're kind of not expecting the same type of reportage as you would from the New York Times or something. Um, but back then, it, everything was smashed into the, just the local paper. So they would occasionally run these stories that would just get more and more outlandish. And one of the f- most famous ones was the Great Moon Hoax, I think of 1840 or something like that, mm-hmm. right around there. Anyway, that was written by Edgar Allan Poe under a pseudonym. And it was really well received because mm-hmm. he's such a good writer. And other people like Mark Twain and even Benjamin Franklin, they had you know did some hoax journalism in their day so there were some accounts that i thought it was just at first i thought it was a one-off and it was just total you know spoof but then Mm -hmm. i just started gathering more and more and but some of the accounts i've gathered um they really sound like someone trying to describe something that they saw that didn't make sense but in the terms of 1897 like um and there was the same fears that we have today if you see something you're afraid people are going to make fun of you um and there were some people who very quickly thought it was judgment day there there Mm -hmm. are you know they used to report in newspapers sometimes they say what the sermon was that week and some of the sermons would be that yeah that he clearly this is the avant courier of the end of days (laughs) you know and they'd be talking oh because um because it was seen at night. Yeah, because most of the sightings were at night, mm-hmm. the ministers thought, oh, this means it must be the devil. <laughs> so it's interesting to me. What really fascinates really? me is mm-hmm, the conclusions they made from there that were based on their time. Because we're yeah. always, all of us are steeped in our time. And me, in 2020, I've seen so many movies and I've t- mm-hmm. ingested so much stuff. But like in 1897, there was one account where a guy farmer was out tending his animals, you know, doing his chores. And he thought he heard a great big bees, swarm of bees coming. And then he saw the great black, oh, hi, Anton, Tony, hi. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so he thought, you know, the great swarm of bees, which, think about it, if you'd never heard a machine before, other than like a physical machine you could do yourself, there wasn't sure there was electricity but you know it was not like now you're not we're also familiar to different like uh, that's a moped that's a truck right um so So back back then then, you know to to describe describe it as bees um i thought was seemed very sincere so you know to me i think there could be something to it and at this point i just want to pull back and really examine it through the lens of the era um but what really got me and one thing that i found compelling is that, that, that it didn't go on it like it it started in march i think and then kind of wrapped up pretty much lasted about three months and then just sort of was gone and then you start see then i start seeing them reports um farther east like in louisiana so i Mm -hmm. thought that was interesting because the first ones before the 1897 ones they actually started in september of 1896 and they kind of work their way across America when you start reading the newspaper ar- archives. So that's one mm-hmm. thing that I'm like, hmm. Now, is this a human inventor? There's a lot of fear. That's one of the theories. Or is this some sort of interdimensional or extraterrestrial? Or are the extraterrestrials right. messing with us by using stuff that we can relate to in our time? I, I don't know. There's a lot to play with there. I've been babbling. but no, There is. Yeah. And I think you make a good point. Um Literature or language writing is code. So when you're reading these accounts, you have to try to figure out, right, is this just someone ent- trying to entertain um, or is it legitimately a hoax? But in either of those cases, you could probably discern from, from the language itself uh, whether someone is being creative and, and, and fabricating something um, using the syntax of its of their time versus somebody who's trying to describe something they can't understand. L- language behaves differently, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's one thing I love about doing historic research is because it really opens up how words have changed over just even even 50 years, even 100 years, the way we use them. Like I, I was... Um, doing another research project and um like you know came across the word alienist 
and that meant you know a psychologist and stuff and just things we don't say right. today but but getting back to the airships um definitely it took me a while i had to kind of get into their sense of humor because you know just as we make fun of public figures they would sometimes be making fun of public figures one of my favorite things i found was actually a a campaign a, a political cartoon making fun of uh president mckinley <laughs> And saying that um, he had all the farmers out there looking for the avant courier of he had a really clunky campaign slogan like I am the avant courier of prosperity or something. We would not do such a clunky thing now. But (laughs) back then. And so they were making fun of it and they showed the the airship and all these farmers looking up for it. So it was kind of funny. (laughs) All right. Uh, Well, we're going to go to our first break here, Tui. Um, when we come back on the other side, you know, I, I want to find out from you, you know, have you, have you ever had any odd occurrences since you're spending so much time uh, near graves and in graveyards and even just researching? Um, one wonders, you know, do you sort of open yourself up to certain experiences? This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on KGRA Radio. Hang in, everybody. We'll be right back with Tui Snyder on the flip side. Keep on coming, they point to the end But I hold on so tight Mainstream media's most wanted KGRARadio.com Lost in a bad way I've gotta let you go Welcome back, everyone. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRA Radio. And Timmy Snyder is jumping back in with us. I literally saw her jumping back in. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it looks like we got some responses that there's a little bit of an echo. Hopefully we have that figured out. But, you know, we are um, going to keep on rolling. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate all the feedback. You can uh, comment live during the show on YouTube. Um, so I try to monitor that, but I can't, you know, see all of those comments because otherwise then I'm not paying attention to Dewey. So, <laughs> but I do my best. And um, if you have questions for her, please comment in Facebook or YouTube and we'll try to get to your questions. Um, but of course, you can call in during the last half hour and using the Paranormal Radio app hotline. That number is 855-472-5483 or 85KGRA live. So, Tui, um, have you ever had a bizarre experience in your, um, during your expeditions? Yes. <laughs> oh, boy. And I laugh because I kind of had to eat crow. Now, I have liked, I would never eat a real crow, but, you know, figuratively, <laughs> um, <laughs> I've liked cemeteries since I was a little kid. And I even, when I was nine years old, this creepy janitor tried to kidnap my friend and I, and we escaped by running through a historic cemetery. So, you know, I, I played in them as a kid. I think now I study cemetery symbols. And for some reason, you know, I also I have that book, which I'll plug right now. <laughs> I have a book that's a travel guide to um, haunted places here in Texas. Mm-hmm. And so if someone says that, you know, old Joe Blow haunts this bridge. I look up and see if anyone named Joe Blow ever lived there. And I'll, I'll be like, no, it was Jim Blow, actually. And, you know, whatever. Right. Um, so, it's a, But it's a, a book that will take you to haunted places. And so a lot of those haunted places end up being cemeteries. But I, I just didn't like that idea. I'm like, why cemeteries? Isn't that, you know, literally and figuratively the last place, you know, a ghost should be? I get it when a ghost haunts their house or their business that they love. Those are some of my favorite ghosts, actually, the ones who hang out at a business that they love or theaters or things like that. 
but so there I was. And so I kind of was a little like, yeah, I'll, re I'll go ahead and write these up. But I don't really believe that cemeteries are haunted. I don't know why I just totally had my head that way, but I did. And, and, and actually, you know, that's one thing I love about doing research is I don't pretend that I don't have a bias. Like I full well know what I believe when I go in. Like I like with the, the alien grave, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. And now I'm like, oh, eight years later, I just can't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. So I went to this cemetery <laughs> with my friend and I'm sure some people out there go to find a grave. Have you ever been to find a grave dot com? No, no. I haven't. Oh, it's wonderful. Anyway. Um, it's, it's, it has it lists all these cemeteries. They even have an app. So sometimes if we're driving on a road I haven't been on, I bring it up and I'm like, ooh, we're five miles from a cemetery I've never been to, a historic one. Let's check it out, you know? How many and, people say it's a wonderful when they refer to <laughs> on a grave? <laughs> I know, I'm so goofy that way, but whatever. I'm just so like, yay, cemeteries. So um, I was going to Elmwood Cemetery in Mineral Wells, which I've got to mm -hmm. say, um, if you, you know, it, you get a lot of bang for your paranormal buck in mineral wells. There's a lot of haunted places there. And I've had, a, I've had a lot of experiences there. Um, so, but I won't, I'm focusing on the cemetery. My friend and I were there and on find a grave, they have a thing called photo requests. So let's say your grandpa is buried in Elmwood Cemetery in mineral wells, but you live in Montana. You could put a photo request. Like I want to see grandpa, what grandpa's grave looks like. And so someone will, so if, I live nearby. I can get a list of these photo requests. So I had printed them out and it was early in the morning. I was there with my friend who's a psychic medium, by the way. And she uh, and I were running around the cemetery and let's see, I, oh, she goes, Tui, you know, well, her thing is when I go to these cemeteries, apparently, according to her and this, I've had several psychics tell me this and I've had a few little experiences as well that Sometimes when I come home, I mm -hmm. children will follow me home. Like kids in real life, like living kids tend to like me. <laughs> but apparently, you know, the kids on the other side tend to like me too. And she was oh. saying, you know, they they like I came to visit her once in her office and the minute I walked in, she's like, Tilly, yeah, you got a whole posse with you. What what is with this? You've you got a bunch of little kids around you. Where have you been today? And I'm like, I was just at a cemetery. And she's like, oh, man, let me. So she, you know, does her thing and gets rid of them all. I'm like, oh, wow, busted. I mean, well, I, I didn't know. So anyway, so that's why she pointed me to this one grave. She goes, you got to go check that grave out and read the epitaph. I'm like, huh? Okay. So I go over to this grave. Um, his last name is Dykerhoff. And the epitaph said, the orphan's true friend. And so I'm thinking, wow, I'll take a few pictures of this and I'll try and find out why he's the orphan's true friend. I haven't figured it out yet, though. I'm still looking, but whatever. So I kind of kneel down. I'm trying to frame it nice. You know, you can't adjust the headstone. So you got to deal with the light you've got. Yeah. So I'm down and I'm, my husband always laughs. He's like, why do you need 12 photos of it? It's not moving. But I'm like, the light is, you know, I'll delete the other 11. So I'm going down. I'm hungering down. All of a sudden I hear like, like. To me, it sounded, and in my mind's eye, I see three little kids just kind of off to the right of me, but I hear, physically hear, not like in my head here. In my head, I saw three little kids. With my physical ears, I heard children giggling. And I thought, oh, and I stand up and I look over, I'm like, is there kids here? Yeah, yeah. And I run over to the bush where it came from, and I look all around, I'm like, is there a school nearby? Is there something? It's not. I'm in the center of... The thing, and I realize, and to confirm, like all the, it's, and it's like ninety-five degrees too, right? And all the hairs on my arm and are just standing up, and I'm like, whoa! So, you know, I would like to go back there maybe and and have a, a you know, get try and get EVPs or something. But I heard that. I mean, so there you go. I kind of had to admit that. All right, I guess now I now I'm, I've made peace with it. I'm like, yeah, you know, cemeteries, and I have a theory as to why cemeteries are haunted. If you want to hear it, I will. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I started to notice that cemeteries, bookstores, and libraries are quite often haunted, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, the thing about that those th places have in common is that they're some of the few places that we get off our devices and we mentally calm ourselves and kind of shut up. Like when you're perusing books in a library, you know, everyone's like, shh, you know, don't do that. I mean, everyone knows that. We all know that. And so I think we get a little meditative, whether we're 
whether we meditated or not. Mm -hmm. And when you're mourning the loss of a loved one, you were connecting through your heart. And I think that you just get into that space. Um, I think that's why. That's just. I think a lot of other places are equally haunted. We just don't shut up enough to hear it. I think. I see. I think we miss so much. So basically, it would be like collectively, over time, all of these people in this space are um, kind of tuning the frequency of that space to be something that's Maybe. more meditative or grounded or, or um, heart centered. Yeah, well, I think we we slow down enough. Like it's like my favorite. Now I have my favorite type of paranormal video on on YouTube. Like since the lockdown, you know, yeah. I've I've had a little more time to look, and I realized oh, the ones I love are the ones where, you know, they would have missed it if they hadn't been. They weren't looking for ghosts. They're like, here, I'm going to show you the perfect way to chop an orange. And it's someone in their kitchen, and they're chopping an orange, and then suddenly all their cupboards fly open, right. or like a shadow walks by, and they're like, what? And nothing else on their channel relates to ghosts, you know, and they're just like, I don't know what that was all about. But it made me think, like, how many things, I mean, so many things in our life. I'm sure there's times when I'm too wrapped up in my head, and maybe something just goes right by me, and it's like, you know, trying to get my attention. Actually, you were saying like, tuning. you know what it, it, it reminds me of? It reminds me of like fish in an aquarium. Um, do you have an aquarium? Uh, no, I, oh. I, I had, I had a little, little aquarium when I was the kid. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I have an aquarium. It's just to the right of me. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> can you see there's my aquarium? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, I have all sorts of little critters in there, crabs and everything. But um, for the most part, the fish don't really pay much attention to me except for the beta fish. Now, if anyone out there has beta fish, and to me, like, it makes it seem like beta fish, they're aware of life outside the aquarium, uh -huh. and they actually care. They actually look at me. And I think sometimes I feel like maybe when I'm going through my life, I'm like a fish in an aquarium, and maybe my higher self or oversoul or deceased loved one is trying to get a hold of me, and it's like tapping on the glass, like, yeah. you know, and I'm just, do, do, do. Oh, did you hear something? Hey, yeah, keep going. Mm -hmm. How frustrating. Maybe that's... I don't know. To me, sometimes it seems like a good metaphor for all that. Oh, so do you think that uh, spirits on the other side then would be frustrated with us? <laughs> I think so. What is wrong with you? Why can't you hear us? <laughs> Come on now. Yeah, I would think so. Like maybe, probably with how people interpret EVPs sometimes, you know? <laughs> Some, unless it's a class A EVP and you get those ones and people like project their fears on it. Oh, he's saying something, you know, and I'm like, how do yeah. you know? It just sounds like, <laughs> you know. Well, I, do I, find, I do find EVPs quite compelling. Yeah, oh, I because, do too. You know, I love them. A, a decent EVP is, you know, clearly a, a person speaking. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of, I think, uh, interpretation, loose interpretation. Um, people kind of just hear what they want to hear. Oh, for sure. We, you know, when a voice is garbled, you can kind of form. It's like pareidolia of the pareidolia, ear. Pareidolia, but of auditorial. Auditor oh. Yes, exactly. Well, did you, did I ever tell you about that doppelganger one I had? Did I ever, or not? I don't recall. Did you well, I, I had one. This was really weird for me because um, I was at the old park hotel in, mm -hmm. in West Texas and it was so lively. Like I was with uh, two paranormal teams that were really good paranormal teams and they were setting up all their equipment. And it, you know, it's the type of team where they were going to take an hour before we could do anything. So I was just staying out of their way. And stuff was happening. Like there was a locked front door. We heard it open and someone call out a name and they just go, hey, Tui, could you go see who that is? Not thinking it's paranormal. I go, nobody's there. It's locked. I'm like, whoa. So I went up and I just sat in a spot where I'd be out of everybody's way. And I thought I'll just do a little EVP session. And I had my little recorder. And I, I said something like, um, I just wondered if there was anybody, if I had any company up here with me, something like that. And then I counted to 10 in my head and I was asking questions like that one after the other. And so when I said that one, like, I just wondered if I had any company up here with me and I'm counting to 10, my friend Greg down below goes, Tui, are you singing? I go, no. And I know I have kind of a, you know, my voice is all over the place. I've got kind of a sing song voice. So I just discounted it like whatever. Meanwhile, I didn't know that one of the, um, my friend Becky had put a, a tape recorder down next to me. And on hers, when I go, I just wondered if I had any company up here with me, you then hear my voice on her recording. 
it sounds exactly like me. Right. And and I, it goes like do 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 do. Meanwhile, on my recording, you hear me go, "Do you have any company up here?" Silence, and then Greg. You know, on hers, you hear Greg. Were you just singing? So it was weird because it sounded exactly like me. The mimicry got me. I don't know what that was. Um, and yeah, so. So is that them reaching into our world, manipulating us? I don't know. I, it was either somebody manipulating me or the funny thing was I mentioned it to my husband and my husband does not believe in ghosts at all. He's really well versed in string theory and quantum mechanics and, you know, all the sci-fi. He's kind of like Spock, you know, but when it comes to anything woo woo, which is kind of nice for me because I'm always having the woo woo stuff happen. And he's just like, what? <laughs> so I don't know. It balances out somehow. But, um, you know, I mentioned it to him and I played him both and he just goes, well, maybe that was another, your counterpart from the multiverse popping in to say hi. I'm like, what? That came out of you? <laughs> You're usually saying, yeah, it was nothing. But it was unmistakably me. <laughs> that was what was weird. It was, it didn't, yeah, that was, or like someone imitating me perfectly, which, oh, and then later they saw me. Like, I'm, I, I don't know what the deal was at that place. Um, I'm sitting in a dark room, you know, as you do on these things sometimes, because there's a lot of downtime on a paranormal um and, and a dark room is always so much better. Yeah. I mean, it was like two in the morning. We were all winding down. All of a sudden, it was Greg again. He goes, Tui, where are you at? And I'm like, I'm over here. And he goes, wow, because I just saw you in the doorway, like, go by. And this is on tape again. And when I was listening back to all my tape, and I realized, and he described this. He said, yeah, I was wearing a little straw hat. And I usually yeah. wear hats. And um, he goes, look just like you, maybe a little shorter. And I'm like, that is so weird. So, like... I'm glad we recorded it because I would not have, I didn't give it that any, I don't know. It was just very strange to me. I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what to make of it either. Do you, wh 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 where do you stand spiritually or, or religiously? Do you think there is an, an afterlife? Um, where do I stand? Let's see. You know, I'm actually just been lately kind of collating all the weird things that have happened to me because I, where I stand is that I definitively to, to me, I am thoroughly convinced that what we're taught is, you know, the consensus reality and sure. what is supposed to be experiencing and what is normal. I had some really wacky experiences throughout my entire life. Now, I thought that by now, you know, as an adult, I mean, that they would be cohesive and make sense. But I've had a lot of really bizarre one-off experiences that don't, you know, they don't add up to like, oh, yes, you know, this all now I've got the grand equation is 42. And I know <laughs> exactly what it is. But I for sure know I've had things, you know, at port, you know, I've had objects just appear in my life that, you know, and I've had. Um, so I, I haven't luckily had, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, okay, so I've had experiences where I like I heard, I was at someone's funeral, and I, I suddenly I feel like I experienced them afterwards and they died from a very painful cancer. This was maybe 15 years ago or something. And I had um, left my, I realized as everyone was leaving and it had been a really beautiful memorial. I mean, we were laughing, we were crying, there were photos of him. And I, you know, um, I went back to get my sweater out of the pew and no one else was there. And as I did, I looked and it was cloudy as I was reaching in. It was white and cloudy around my sweater. And I'm like, well, that's weird. And then I just went, Max, is that you? And I got, yes, and I'm free and it, in my head. And I was like, whoa, and, and all the hairs went up. And so to me, that was a very, and then I thought, what do I do with this experience? Do I tell? And I got this sense that he was so happy because he had suffered from this. He'd really, he'd had like been told he was going to live eight months. And then he went on to live like, you know, 12 years kind of thing. But he, yeah. he was in a lot of discomfort. And the sense I got, like, a, it was, you know, it was not so much words, but a knowing that, wow, he's happy. He's doing well. And so then at the, like the dinner or whatever later, I didn't know mm -hmm. whether I should tell anyone or not. And I finally told his sister about it and she was really happy because I, you know, I talked to a few people and I said, oh, his sister would be very open to that. But I didn't want to, you know, be rude in any manner. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought if this could provide her with any comfort, uh, yeah. maybe. So I think, I do think that consciousness continues. Um, I believe in, you know, we talk about fat past lives all the time. I watch a lot of like science documentaries and stuff. And, you know, like our scientists can't even, I love it how the best brains can't even describe what time is. 
and like why we experience it the way we do. And so when I think of a past life, I don't say I think I was a monk. I say I am a monk in another life because I think it's all happening at once. And aha, uh-huh. so, so you believe time is sort of infinite. Yeah, or just simultaneously. mind blowing, freakishly mind blowing. I can't. Uh, I can only take it a little bit. Yeah. But then future lives too. So some some of my experiences, I wonder, were maybe me playing a prank on myself to like wake me up because I had some experiences as a kid that were just, you know, not too scary, like uh, not full on poltergeist, like things flying around, but things happening around the house that didn't make sense. Okay. And so I think that helped me stay awake. If that makes sense, you know, awake to the world, like, oh, I, yeah. and, I, and I think I fall asleep uh, and it's kind of like something then happens again in my life. Like there's times in my life where I've tried to be normal. <laughs> yeah. I've given up on that. But earlier I would try <laughs> going to be normal and have the job and do the thing or whatever. And, um, you know, and then something just gooses me back into like, there's more to the world than what you, you know, you don't fall for that crap again. Yeah. That's what it is for me. Yeah. And I think, I think it's fine. Some people that works for them, you know, um, you know, doing a nine to five job, you have your uh, yeah. career set or, you know, employment and that's, that's what you're comfortable with. You do that. Definitely. And then you have your outside life, your family, your friends, and, and you enjoy your weekends. I, you know, that's, that's fantastic. Um, but then, yeah, there are uh, others <laughs> yeah. just, just, you know, you know, are, uh, dance to a different beat. Um, yeah, I'm and, not allowed and, to do that. If it's like something won't allow me to be that kind of normal. I mean, I admire right. that is great and everything, mm-hmm. but there's something that's like, no, that you come on, knock it off. You're not that's not why you're here, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you've embraced it and you're yeah. comfortable with it, right? I am. Although sometimes I wish I could make more sense out of it, but in a way I'm I, in a way there's a part of me that goes, "Oh, making sense out of it is somehow missing the point as well." Yeah. If you know, it's just in just stay open. I guess it's, it's you can't pin it down. All right, I have to ask you about this: the Great oh. Hanging Site. What is that about? Oh boy, yeah. So, um, in 1862, uh, it, the the governor of Texas said that uh, everyone, all men, 18 to 35, had to join the Confederacy and serve. Yeah, there were a few ways to get out of it. I think you could pay your way out of it if you had a, were a school teacher and had enough students, um, things like that. But, um, you, you know, not everybody. This is one of those things where I think, um, okay, I've got a couple of things to say. When you study historic cemeteries, you can't help but learn in America. You can't help but learn about the Civil War. And I got to tell you, I lived in the South until I was 10 years old, and I had my fill of the Civil War. It seemed like all we ever talked about. I mean, there was even a playground fight over the Civil War once <laughs> when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, good grief, you know. So we moved to the North, and I'm like, ugh, you know, I, I didn't consider myself a, a war buff or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But the Civil War impacted um, our, you know, the, that's when we started doing embalming. That's when we started um, mass producing coffins. Right. That's when we started, you know, so there's a lot. You just can't help but learn it. Plus, more lives were lost during the Civil War than any other conflict in American history. Mm-hmm. I, I have a, a little graph that I like to use when I give talks to show them, like, you know, this many people died in every other war. And then here's the Civil War on, on the graph. And it's like, so my, what, what this meant was we were a nation in mourning. We were a nation right. grappling with death. And you see it, um, our, our attitude toward je- death really changed too. Like we went from being like, you know, it's, you're going to heaven or hell, doesn't matter what you do, it's been figured out, to much softer. People needed some comfort. Everybody mm-hmm. had lost a, a dear one. So anyway, and another thing too is people just automatically assume that all the southern states just wanted, you know, okay, we're going to secede from the Union. Well, Texas was a little different. It wasn't a huge slave state. There were some slavers, yes, but it wasn't the primary thing. And I have a couple stories in the book that hinge on this. There was another one where there were some um, Civil War men who wanted to leave and join the Union and fight for the Union. And I have a thing about them. But this great hanging site just shocked me because this is an example of that overlooked history or forgotten history. Because, mm-hmm. well, what happened was a bunch of... Um, I guess you call them rogue um, Confederates. They made a little kangaroo court and they rounded up, oh my gosh, 42 men and accused them of being Northern sympathizers. Well, actually, they kind of wanted, it was, they wanted their land. It wasn't 
really, you know, it's very sketchy. It, there's a lot more to it, and I'm totally simplifying it. And even in the book, I don't go into, you know, all of these 50 chapters are just little samples. Some of them have had books written about them. This one has had books written about it, this whole great hanging thing. But what got me was this was the biggest mass lynching in American history. And it happened in Gainesville, Texas in 1862. Um, 42 people. Yeah, it was a big elm tree. And I've got an illustration, too, in my book where just all these bodies, they would hang two or three men each night until there were like 42 men, I think, hung. A couple were shot as they tried to escape. Yeah, it was yeah. just a horrible, you know, no one's proud of this. And see, that's the thing. When something really horrible happens in your town, mm -hmm. there's an urge to disown it and pretend that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I try to talk to local historians about certain things, especially lynchings can be very touchy. I've, I've tried to speak to um, over in Eastland, there was the lynching of the Santa Claus bank robber. And the local historians wouldn't talk to me about it. But luckily, their local sheriff would. And he was a bit of a historian himself. So anyway, getting back to that, it's this horrible chapter in American history, but it really shows the need for real courts and law and justice and not taking the law in your own hands. I mean, so that's why I think it's important. I think that's one reason this book is timely. I think that's what makes history timely is when you learn actual stories, even the yucky stuff that we, you know, if I lived in Gainesville, I wouldn't be going, you know, I'd take my friends there, but I mean, it's not like you're, you're proud of it. It's just that let's acknowledge that this happened and let's examine why and make sure this type of thing doesn't happen again. But it's been a very um, locally, uh, ce celebrating, uh, you know, that's the wrong mm -hmm. word. Memorializing it has been very touchy subject, even now. Mm -hmm. They try yeah, to. And, yeah. yeah, it's interesting because uh, you don't want to sweep history under the rug, uh, no. um, um, nor do you want to celebrate you know, the wrong thing. And there's like, no. there's a lot of back and forth with that, you know, especially now mm -hmm. in our nation. And yeah. you know, having a conversation uh, with someone who uh, is from the South and, and I'm from New Jersey and I live in New York now. Um, the way we talked about the Civil War was was clearly quite different than than the way it was taught and um, conversed. That is nuanced. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, you know, for us, it was like there was only one uh, flag that we were proud of. And that, that was the American flag, right? So yeah. there, there was no um, there was no other alternative sort of uh, history or culture that we we associated with it. So so for me, that was always kind of a a strange thing to try to understand. It's almost like um, if I took huge pride in my New Jersey flag. Well, like yeah. not, not very many people really take huge pride in their in their state flags, right? It's not um, something. You know, that, Texans that, really know their history. But that's but that's, well, that yeah that that I think that because the North was the sort of winning side, I think it affected the psychology of it. Um, oh. And and in the North, you kind of learn broad strokes yeah. uh, of what happened in the Civil War. Um, whereas in the South, there was there was a lot of pain inflicted. Whether they were fighting on the wrong side of history or not, there was a lot of pain um, and defeatism. And you know they were they needed a way to to kind of get through that and get over that. Um, does that make sense to you? Growing up, oh, totally, totally. I was going to say one thing that I thought was really interesting, and I think people should be thinking about now, is. Um, I was doing, um, for Memorial Day, I did a, a YouTube video about the history of Memorial Day. And Memorial Day is in May, as we all know. But, uh, but it was originally only for Union soldiers. So it wasn't for the Confederates. The Confederates, dead, had to do their own things separately. Um, and the first official military markers were only for Union soldiers. And then they branched out. They were for... Spanish American, you know, every other war, but, but the Confederates had to get their own separate, they have their own separate headstone. They eventually got mm -hmm. one in like 1903. So, but I was, one thing I was reading was, um, so they, they finally started celebrating the union and the Confederacy together and Memorial day. And, uh, a lot of this healing took place with people who had actually fought on both sides in mm -hmm. the Civil War, and they would get together and celebrate together and say, hey, and in these women, it was a lot of mothers, and there's, they, I've come across a lot of editorials and newspapers where women say, hey, you know, this boy died, he fought for the South, mm -hmm. um, but we still lay flowers on his grave because he was someone's son. Right. Yeah. And just that they, there was like, let's mend this hate, mm -hmm. let's get, let's not be divided, Let's not 
And, and I found that like, wow. And yet, you know, nowadays there's all this red and blue and divisiveness. I'm like, yeah. you need to read some of these old editorials where these people who actually went, had a leg blown off or lost an eye with us mm -hmm. fighting against each other and what they're saying about like, let go of the hatred. And these ladies would get together and, you know, just let's just realize we're all hurting. We all lost people and we're all moving forward as a United Nation, you know, as, as the United States. Mm -hmm. And to me, it really was beautiful and very, I don't know if anyone wants to see that. I, it was a really interesting one. It was on my YouTube channel and I, I really did a lot of research on it and I thought it was very um, yeah. timely in this odd way, which, you know, and like I said, I'm not someone who gets into war history, but, mm -hmm. but the personal, seeing how people, their attitudes, I was like, wow, that's mature. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to find that, you know, when people try to listen to what the other side has to say, um, instead of just dating their heels in, you know, conversation can move forward um, and it can be much more healing. You know, oh, I just oh, go ahead. Thought, I'm just going to say, you know, I often say that cemeteries, historic cemeteries are mm -hmm. open air museums. Right, and right. I kind of think all those civil war statues and things that they're tumbling down, put them in a section of a cemetery because <laughs> some of them are, are in cemeteries. I mean, when I am in a cemetery and mm -hmm. I see a Confederate flag on someone's grave who fought, in the civil war, I don't, I feel like, okay, you're just telling me something. You're not, it's not racist. It's not, it's not, it's from the, that's their battle flag that they fought under. You know, I, I kind of get it. it. It's historical context. You know, when I see it on someone's truck, just modern, I'm like, meh, why are you doing that? But in the, in the cemetery, right? I feel like the cemetery, like once again, it's that kind of history. We don't want to sweep under a rug. So put mm -hmm. all the statues there and they have some, placards that are up you know that are zinc placards or whatever that will stand up and people can read like this you know this is what this was and this yeah, is what absolutely. that was so we could go and because you're in that frame of, oh this is the past you know i'm I'm here to learn about the past i'm mm -hmm. not yeah well context matters as well um again yeah. you know growing up in new jersey if if you had a confederate flag hanging in the back of your truck that only meant one thing it wasn't southern pride yeah but you go down south it means something different um, and I think that's where this this um, discord and dysfunction of conversation, you know, comes to a head and it just breaks down completely. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yes, you can't forget history. Uh, no. you, know, you shouldn't. Tear, but we can, but we shouldn't. <laughs> but we shouldn't. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's it's very fascinating that I I, I think that graveyards are um, like you said almost like museums and they really we, are. We need to preserve history in ways that, um, you know, perhaps, you know, a, a township or a county or a state may have forgotten uh, to honor. Um, mm -hmm. But I do have to ask you about this gravesite. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Woodson James, um, born uh, September 5th, 1847, died August 15th, 1951. Yeah, so he'd be like 103 or something. <laughs> what's, like, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, this one's a really wacky one. Okay, so, well, and he's, guess, guess what? He is not the only alleged real Jesse James mm -hmm. in Texas. There's another one who maybe when I do the sequel to this book, because there were a lot of stories that I couldn't get to or you know i ran i mean i was like this book's already getting pretty hefty I, I think i've got enough to do another one but anyway uh so jesse james you know allegedly died in what was it missouri in 1882 um but it's a little bit suspicious and you can even google this because um he looks different the photos of him in his coffin and then the photos of him after he was immediately dead his facial hair is a little different okay and his he and his he had attempted to fake his own death before, but he, they didn't provide a body that time. So it just they weren't able to sustain the rumor, yeah. and then he was seen. So so actually, Tui, let's hold it right there okay. because the second break has caught up to us. Oh, <laughs> um, but we will continue this conversation about the real or not so real uh, Christy James grave. We will find out. Hopefully on the other side, this is Alan B. Smith or Paranormal Now on KGRA Radio. Thank you for tuning in every Saturday night, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. We'll see you on the flip side.
mainstream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com I try to capture how I feel and tell you the truth But there's so much to be said So I just leave your small clues But now I'm burying my soul And the soul loves you Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith. Hanging with me tonight is Tui Snyder. And taking us out of the break was Septembrio. Septembrio is spelled with Y dot com. If you want to find out more about their music, um, please go check them out and uh, help support them because they are just really, really good people. Um, and I do want to say that Amanda Curran earlier had brought up that the Amuamua object we were speaking of, the interplanetary object, uh, the name comes from Hawaiian, meaning scout. From O, meaning reach out for, and Mua, uh, reduplicated for emphasis, meaning first in advance of, and reflects the way the uh, this object is like a scout or messenger sent from the distant past to reach out to humanity. That's really romantic. I love that. Ooh, I like it. I do. So, okay, so let's talk about Jesse James. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was kind of spacing out on that. <laughs> well, all right. So... Whatever happened, 1882, he was mm-hmm. allegedly shot, killed, you know, the end, the end, right? Well, you know, back then, if you wanted to move to another state and take up another identity, uh, it was a lot easier. So there, it could have happened. Maybe he did. In 1951, he shows up in Granbury, Texas, and he's on his deathbed. And he, he requests that the local sheriff come talk to him. Mm-hmm. And, and so the local sheriff um, came and sp- spoke to him over a period of nine days. And he listened to his, you know, deathbed confessions. And he really, um, he claimed to be, you know, he was going by another name, but he said, hey, I really am Jesse Woodson James. Um, I, I came back here because I, you know, the one girl I really loved was from this area. I want to die here in Granbury. And he gave the sheriff his spurs and his handcuffs, his favorite necktie, stuff like this. So the sheriff actually was a history buff. And so he asked this Jesse James, whatever, (laughs) wannabe, a series of questions that he, you know, to to try and trip him up and see if he really was Jesse James. And apparently he he answered all the questions with flying colors. And what clinched it for um, at least the sheriff was that his post-mortem exam, um, he, there was like a burn mark around, you know, around his neck as, as though someone had tried to hang him. Mm-hmm. He had a bunch of, um, both feet had burn scars on them. The end of an index finger was missing that was similar to Jesse's. He had a, a tattoo that supposedly Jesse James had, it said Tex Wise on it. Um, and so, he, the and it had all, he was riddled with bullets whole, you know, old bullet wounds as well. Um, and so that, that really, you know, made it, clinched it for the sheriff. So, you know, but still, what are you going to, ha- what are you going to do? I mean, they didn't have DNA testing back then, sure. but finally there was a guy, um, he took it on as his personal, he's like, he's, a, I think a used car salesman or a car salesman of some sort. And, uh, he's just a real Jesse James enthusiast, you would say. And in the year 2000, he, obtained a court order to exhume the body and do a DNA test. So they exhume a casket and right away the Jesse James enthusiast was worried because um, Jesse James is allegedly buried in a wooden casket and what they dug up was metal. Uh And then to make it worse, when they opened it up, uh, he was missing an arm (laughs) entirely, like, you know, a forearm. And they had dug up the grave of W.H. Holland, this guy who his arm is actually buried in a separate spot in that same, I've got a little thing. So the chapter before I talk about his arm being buried separately because that was kind of a thing people would do back then. And I read, I mean, I just went on a jag where I was reading about all sorts of arms and legs being buried separately and people really believed. And then there was all sorts of cases where they were like, you know, my wife, my wife said her, 
her uh, our amputated arm was fingers were bugging her, so we dug it up and straightened the fingers out, and now she feels better. You know, stuff like that. There's all sorts of. Um, I'll do a video about this eventually and share all the the research I found because it was That'd really cool. kind of interesting. But long story short, they accidentally dug up W. H. Holland, and that the reason that happened is because people have stolen Jesse James headstone a few times over the years, and when they put it back or gotten a new one, they kind of put it in a different spot apparently. And so they weren't able because the court order was just to exhume one casket. Nothing's happened in the last 20 years. I, you know, it's tied up in paperwork and money and, you know, getting permissions. I, I think it would be great (laughs) if someone came along and did it and just tried to, you know, it's kind of like the space alien grave, the local cemetery association will not allow them to, they rather cheekily say you you must notify next of kin before you can do that. But, Mm -hmm. but beyond that, they really just, we don't want people digging it up. Do you think the Aurora uh, alien grave, they, they do that because they want tourists to continue to come there? Um, No, I, they don't want tourists. Well, they did for the longest time. And like, even when I first started researching it, locals Mm -hmm. didn't want to talk about it. But now um, when you drive through town, which takes about (laughs) five seconds, um, right when you get into town the welcome to aurora sign is like a crashed disc and a little alien it is so cool and now it says like a yeah they've gotten into it now locals will talk about it more but for a while there it was kind of like it was hard to get much out of people well look if if going back to that story if the aurora ufo crash was a fabricated story why would you bury something that's the thing and it um yeah it was the day before easter and I don't I haven't been able to find an actual account of the funeral, but you know the, the crash happened the day before Easter. They mm-hmm. buried it the next day, um, and yeah, that's what you did when you found. I have all sorts of stories in, um, you know, in my book about uh, what they would do when there's someone came through town and died and didn't have ID. You know, one of my stories is about a family of seven who they were pioneers or whatever they were traveling through. Who knows whether they were going to settle there or not, but mm-hmm. they they died. And I, I kind of go into detail into what happened because um, they don't know. Like maybe they had food poisoning or something. They died before anyone even got to say hi to them and really get to know them. So this family is seven. And so the locals, the women sewed them new dresses and outfits so they wouldn't have to be buried in their death clothes. That's something you come across a lot. And um, and then the the locals, they built coffins for them and they just they buried them. What you do, you know, you give them a decent burial. That's just the thing. So to me, that was another thing because Aurora, the town of Aurora had gone through a lot. They'd had a plague that mm-hmm. went through that, uh, that if you survived it, you might be partially paralyzed or blind, which back then, wow. I mean, it's hard enough to get around these days if, with an infirmity, but imagine trying to make it, you know, and yeah. back then. Um, and so they, they just were like, we don't know what this thing is. We're burying it. So to me, that seemed realistic because I've, I've read people or I've had people say, well, why didn't they donate it to science? Why didn't they dissect it? Nobody was doing that back then. You didn't do that to bodies. I mean, that's why we had body snatchers <laughs> all throughout America for, back then. For scientists. Yeah, the right. resurrectionists, they call them. And I've, I've yeah. read some really damn creepy accounts of what they did, but that's what they had to do because there was a stigma against it. You were either a criminal you know, criminals sometimes would be dissected, but these mm-hmm. medical colleges needed those bodies. And that's a whole nother thing yeah. <laughs> that I've looked into before. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, we're, <laughs> what happens if you get caught stealing a body for medical purposes back then? You know, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. I don't, I mean, you know, there would be some sort of, you could go to jail for it, but you no. know, I haven't really looked into that. I have looked, what I have read about are, riots um the one really the one that really gave me nightmares was um there was oh this is so creepy okay Mm -hmm. so this guy his daughter died and he heard a rumor uh that um she had been donated to that her you know donated to a a college nearby and and so he and his buddies went to that college and he saw and recognized her hand um and so they came back and like you know burnt had a big riot and burnt the college. Um, And there were at least 17 different college riot, you know, riots and and violence where people Mm -hmm. would would find that someone had been taken. And there were a lot of countermeasures that they took. So, you know, back then people really thought you were going to be judgment day. You're going to need all your pieces. I mean, so that this is a roundabout way of saying that I just makes sense in the mentality of 1897 
to mm-hmm. just, oh, we don't know what this is. Doesn't matter. We're giving it a good Christian burial because that's what you do when, with an unidentified thing that comes through town. <laughs> do you think that <laughs> for forever? They, do you think if they bury, uh, dug up the grave of this Jesse James, that it would be definitive proof? Would it? Would it be worth doing uh, well, examining the grave? I think it would. That I really think would be worthwhile because there are uh, relatives with DNA that they can compare it to. I mean, although it's a little crazy, he would have to be awfully old, (laughs) but maybe they do dig up the other one that's in the other town, which I haven't gotten to go see yet. I haven't, I haven't looked into. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't know. How long does, is, is DNA stable where you can. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I know that hair takes an awfully long time to, to decay. I mean, they can dig, Mm -hmm. you know, dig up, people and tell like oh they died from arsenic or they were or they were taking morphine you know you could tell right. a lot of people from people's hair a lot of things from people's hair so yeah but i don't know be, i don't I know it will depend on the the environment that it's it's buried in that's um, true I, I know that they've been able to extract soft tissue from some dinosaur bones oh, um, yeah. i haven't heard much of that lately but i would say mm-hmm. i think that that came out about four or five years ago um, oh. There was a, a scientist that she she was able to do this. She she actually asked the question that nobody asked, thought to ask. Oh yeah, yeah, and she, she was great. Cut, she mm-hmm. cut into the bones and I was like, and, yeah. and you know, pulled some material out. I was like, oh my gosh. And they didn't take her seriously because she was female. Like as I recall, they gave her a little bit. She had to fight against that a little bit. Anyway, oh, I don't I don't know about that. But it's a different I, I gal. I, oh, I was I was just like, wow. No, it might have it might have been. I just remember seeing. Uh, I think it was like a PBS special, yeah. or and then it started getting traction, um, and articles online. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if people were like, uh, really. Uh, but yeah, well, scientists in general, I admire the advancements because I I watch a lot of documentaries about mm-hmm. scientists and physicists and you know people who are really trying to stretch the boundaries of our belief system and yes. and yeah. then you see what they go through you know they are ridiculed by their peers i was reading about the guy who one of the guys who um you know came up with string theory and he <laughs> went to tell his um gosh i forgot their names now he he was a russian guy and he went to talk to like alan oh i'm blanking on the physics physics I can't even say it now, the physicist's names. Mm-hmm. But anyway, he went to tell this other physicist about his theory, and, and the guy fell asleep while he was he's, he's turning oh. around from the blackboard. The guy's falling asleep. But, and so he thought, oh, it must suck. Well, later on, it turned out to be, I think they toured together and you know learned from each other. But you look mm-hmm. at what people have gone through. They've been imprisoned for saying, I think that maybe, you know, we're going around the sun. Or, you know, the, like to dare, to dare, to just put your your ideas out there and just say what you have observed. I, I really do admire that. Yeah. In the paranormal world, scientists do often get sort of a bad rap yeah. um, for being, you know, ultra conservative or protected of their work or, mm-hmm. or bias because they need money and funding from universities, yeah. which are all, um, you know, legitimate criticisms. But, you know, I, I, I have so much respect for, for scientists um, who are just trying to do good work. And, you know, it's, it's the same thing that whether it's paranormal or science, I find it so all just fascinating. Um, you know, if I could live another lifetime, I, I, I would have probably, if I could have do math better, <laughs> I would have gone the route of, of trying to find a job working for something like NASA. Um, you know, whether, you know, we do have alternative technology that can fly to Mars right now anyway, and, and we've landed there or whatever. Yeah. I would still want to be a part of sending probes there and mm-hmm. being part of that scientific, um, you know, exploration. I'm always amazed by the math they can do and the thought experiments they can do um, and come up with, you know, that just seem crazy. Like something will, a physicist will start out with just a thought experiment. They're just up in their attic thinking and then they're doing math and then, you know, they present it to their peers who then ridicule them because how do we, how do we, um, we need for science, we need a replicable study. We need to be able to do this and have the same results come over and over. And maybe when they come up with this great idea, the, they don't have the tools to do that yet. And sometimes they die before that happens. And then someone else picks up their study and is able to create, Oh, we can, there's a study and they prove them right. You know, I mean, I just, Oh, that kind of thing that, just the power of the imagination. Um, I've got a great imagination, but I'm not making any great discovery. 
<laughs> like that. But I, you know. But you're right. But you are, um, it, they're discoveries for us because you're doing your research and you're sharing it with the world. And, and it's fascinating. I, the story. I guess I can relate to them. I can relate to the tenacity of research. And I, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I recall the story that uh, someone told me who will not be named um, when they were young in their, I think, like early 20s, uh, they were camping, I think camping or something like this on, on some kind of trip. And uh, they had accidentally discovered that there was an ar- archaeological dig um, going on nearby. So, you know, they kind of like peered through the trees. They could see the dig going on, blah, blah, blah. Well, they, you know, they weren't like crazy drunk or anything, but they were drinking and they had, you know, like bottles of beer at nighttime uh, they snuck into this archaeological site, oh, no. <laughs> and um, the the archaeologist had recovered a skeleton, <laughs> you know, for the nighttime. Right? They put uh. the dirt, dirt back over it or whatever, so they can continue the next day. Well, they removed the dirt and they took a label off of the beer bottle. Oh my god! Uh-huh. Put it on the <laughs> the head of the skull, the forehead, <laughs> and oh, then buried gosh. it back up again. And then they were quite surprised the next morning when they resumed their dig. Oh, that is hilariously mischievous. <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness gracious, yeah. Well, have you have you come across any, you know, just uh uncanny stories uh that you just thought were just totally ridiculous? Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it's funny. Well, okay, well, we were talking about discoveries. I did make a discovery mm-hmm. in my book. Um I discovered the true identity of the mysterious rope walker of Corsicana. Really? Yes. Would you like me to tell you? <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> I will share. All right. So back in 1883, in the town of Corsicana, Texas, which is world famous, wild, wildly known for its fruitcake, <laughs> but uh, among other things, they do make a good fruitcake there. they got a great bakery. I'm not being paid to say that. <laughs> Maybe I'm craving baked goods. But in their Hebrew cemetery, there is a grave, and it just says rope walker 1884 that's it well what happened when i was doing some research i was trying to like i like to do my own research so you know there's there's modern newspaper articles and things about this guy but i wanted to go back to you know in the day and find some actual timely information i couldn't find anything in 1884 so eventually i just looked for rope walker and a one-legged tight rope walker and i found a guy who had come through corsicana in 1883 and he, what he had done was he was selling wood stoves and to, um, attract attention, he, t- he tied a rope between like 20 foot high off the ground between two buildings. He strapped a wood stove to his back, climbed up. And then like, he's one legged, he had a little peg leg with a notch in it. Mm-hmm. And he was walking across the tightrope and it drew quite a crowd. So this was his little scheme. Okay. Then I'll sell you wood stoves. But one of the things he tied <laughs> his tightrope to broke and he went tumbling to the ground and it the the stove landed on his good leg Mm -hmm. so they had to amputate it and uh now what everyone has said is like well before he died he told them he was jewish so they got a jewish shopkeeper to come and recite prayers with him and then he died but um I found that he had a name, a stage name, Professor Dahoon. It was spelled like a bunch of different ways because you come across that a lot. If something's not written down, there's a lot of misspellings. And um, I still didn't have a name. But um, so, you know, up until now, everyone's just thought, oh, well, we'll never know who he is. Well, I just kind of shortly before the book was really going to come out, I just kept looking and looking and I, I kept searching from different angles. And suddenly I discovered that there was another one-legged tightrope walker out there named Joseph Berg. And I'm thinking, how many can there be? So I find an article from 1869 where he had had another tightrope uh, accident where his eye ball popped out and both wrists were crushed. I mean, this guy had been through a lot. And he was in the hospital. I have a bunch of fun quotes where the people he apparently um, was telling them all about his life story. Well, he said his stage name was Professor Dahoon. So I, I connected them together, and I now know that the mysterious rope walker of Corsicana is actually a man named Joseph Berg. There, I just sort of condensed a lot of oh, little. <laughs> the rope, the rope walker. Uh, what 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 is he famous for? Why why do people know so know about him? Well, because it's been an enduring local mystery. So mm-hmm. in the Corsicana, it's just no one. And what to me is still, I'm curious about is because the 
headstone says 1884. Well, his fatal incident, you know, where he lost his other leg was 1883 from the newspaper articles that I found sprinkled all around. Um, so he had been a, pr a professional gymnast in Europe. He came to America. Um, he lost his leg fighting for the Union. Um, and then he, you know, couldn't do his gymnastics anymore, but he created this tightrope routine for himself and traveled around selling wood stoves, apparently. And, um, you know, he died without ID. Now, that's kind of a, a recurring theme throughout my book is what happens when people die without identification. You know, different things can happen. In his case, you know, they just buried him and they hoped someone would find him. Um, in other cases, I have a couple um, incidents, you know, and, and when I give talks, I've gotten so used to this because I come across it so much. Like 100 years ago, I'm used to what people would do. So I'll be talking, giving a talk, and I'll mention that, okay, this person died. And so they, they, they put his body in a chair in the furniture store for a week to see if anybody would identify him. And like the audience would be like, oh! and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm kind of used to that's what they did before people had ID. They would be like, well, let's just sit him in a chair and hope somebody goes by and goes, hey, there's Paul or whatever, you know, which is just so macabre and creepy. And it was usually the furniture store because those would um, before coffins were mass produced they might make them there they were usually the, doubled as a morgues so it's just one of those weird creepy things that like I love how much things have changed in like 120 years that you know that just sounds really creepy we would never do that now but everyone has ID or there's some you put them in a database or whatever so mm -hmm. uh, Tui, we got some comments that it was a little dark and people would like to see you more I don't oh, know if, okay. we can, if we can do Let that try. okay hang on um, sure, it's getting darker in the meantime, oh. if you want to call in uh, later and ask Tui uh, your questions, you can call 855-472-5483. That's the Power Radio app line or 85-KGRA-LIVE. Uh, just call in. Bill Skywatcher, our producer, will receive your call. Stand by. He'll cue you. Um, and I'll bring you on the air. And I'd actually really like to hear your own stories. Um, so if anybody out there has a graveyard story or a close encounter with a spirit, a ghost, um, or entity, I would really like to hear uh, what it was like for you. I have found that when I hear your story, when I listen, uh, when I'm listening to other shows and listening to guests, uh, it, it's more tangible and you get a better sense of what the experience is like rather than if it's written or a message. So again, if you want to call in and ask Tui your question or share your story, 855-472-5483. Uh, so Tui, how are we doing? Well, did that help at all? I think <laughs> I tried. We'll a little bit. A little bit, a little bit, but that's all right. We're, I knew we're, it was going to get dark while we're on, and I guess I didn't quite real. Now the cat's going crazy because, as they do this time of night. Well, oh, I did well. see your cat in the background earlier. Did you? Yes. Yeah. She's, she's up now and running <laughs> all around. I saw the white paws. I didn't see him. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but your cat does have white paws, right? Or was I seeing yeah, something? She, oh, yeah, okay. maybe it's a ghost cat. Woo! <laughs> no, she does have white paws. She's a little tabby. She's still got her harness on because I actually put her outside on a heart. Oh, there she goes. She's oh, running. Did yeah. you see that? She's, she's talking good. about me. Woo. Uh, and isn't it funny though, how cats kind of do know when you're talking about them. And, and the, oh yeah. And just go off a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my yeah. Thing. Oh, I wish I had a lamp or something. Oh, well, I guess it's darker in here than I realized. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask you about this case as well. Oh yeah. Uh, can you tell us about this? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, that is, the last uh, scraped graveyard that I'm aware of here in Texas. And, and what so, is a, a scraped graveyard? Well, um, about, you know, if you could travel back in time, 100 mm. years ago, 120 years ago, even before that, especially throughout the South, you would find graves that, yards that look like that. Because mm -hmm. um, nowadays, when you think of a cemetery, you know, you think of like a wide expanse of lawn. Don't you? You know, you think of grass. You think of, exactly. you know, you go there and you see people mowing. You see the la Well, that was here in the South, especially throughout the South, there were what they had called scraped graveyards. And so once a year, boy, my cat's going crazy. This <laughs> is going bonkers. Oh, well, once a year, people would, uh, would have decoration day. And this was usually in springtime because that's when everyone has flowers going, growing. And you didn't have florists. So you wanted to come and decorate everybody's graves and so um, maybe uh, three or four days before this all the men would come 
usually from a church or the community, and they would use a hoe and whatever else they had because, um, you know, we didn't have lawnmowers <laughs> back then. And you would scrape all the dirt from all the graves. And it would just be bare, not even a single blade of grass. And, uh, and this was meant as a, you know, considered to be a sign of respect. This is what you did. But it was also very practical because um, it kept, um, you know, creatures like, um, like livestock from running through and trampling a grave. Or, and, so it was, it, and you could also keep, you could see snakes and, you know, critters, things like that more easily. And that sort of mounded um, grave too was uh, often it would be studded with um, mussels shells or clam shells. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that this practice is actually pretty common even today on the Ivory Coast, where a lot of uh, slaves were taken from. Mm-hmm. And so, some people theorize that you know this practice was something that uh, came people observed um, you know African Americans doing, and so oh, it, it realized that it had a practical application, so that it just spread. What for whatever reason, um, until really until um, the late nineties, I've uh, there were a lot of these graveyards still left here in Texas, and um, I spoke at a monument builders conference, and which was really neat because monument builders, people who build headstones, it tends to be a family business. So you ask one person, they're like, "Let me go ask Grandpa," you know, and they're and they really have a lot of history, and I learned a lot of history, and I got a lot of leads for places to check out. And they told me that the only scraped graveyard left in Texas that they were aware of was over in Denson, Texas. And uh, it's really thick clay soil, doesn't grow stuff real well, but they've maintained that tradition. I mean, I took that picture a couple of years ago and uh, yeah, so, but I tried to find other, like I, I had a book that was written in the 80s and it, it told about, oh, here, all these, it had all these different scraped graveyards. And so I would go and I'd be like, nope, not scraped anymore. So now I can kind of tell um, when it's not a scraped graveyard. And, and long story mm-hmm. short, when the Great Depression came, people moved away to find work. So families were scattered. So they weren't able to go back and maintain their family cemeteries anymore. So it was easier when someone else takes over. Let's just plant grass. Let's make it easy to mow. It changed. The Great Depression had this great, you know, the Civil War had a huge impact on cemeteries. And then the Great Depression did as well in different ways. And so now we our associations for memorial gardens is different we expect grass now we yeah we do we we do and when i look at this image it it looks abandoned to me it it looks (laughs) you know like it was um it's it's not though there were even some go ahead ahead. no good i'm gonna say yes not though it's even there's even some modern um burials there too i took a whole bunch of photos it was really interesting it's fenced off and inside the fence it's just all pretty well scraped and sandy and Another thing they would do, too, is you'll still see this where um, some people, so they keep the, the scrape, they would put rocks all over or pebbles all over. And so when I'm in a historic cemetery and I come to a plot where there's rocks all over the entire plot, I'm thinking, oh, I bet this was, you know, this whole place was scraped earlier. And that's why, you know, it's kind of how some people do that with their lawns. They don't want to mow them. And that's it. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, can, I, can, I can go on and on. I can rambling. I'm like, geez, I'm just going on and no, on. No, no, yeah, no, maybe I, I should shut up a little bit. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, a, so, it's a really interesting practice. I thought it was quite interesting. And uh, yeah, they got the headstone, the footstones, the mounded graves, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they, uh, this was in East Texas. And uh, yeah, it was the only one I could find. And does, it affect, the, hmm? does it affect the bodies at all differently if there is flooding um, or, you know, storms or what have you? Well, you know, a lot of that has to do with the soil. I, I was thinking back to that Monument Builders Conference I went to, and they were talking about how, um, you know, I never go alone to a cemetery, it's just because especially a lot of these are in, they are really in remote areas, and you don't have cell phone coverage, and something happens, twist an ankle or whatever. This one uh, Monument Builder told me that he he was like, I, I knew I should have done it, but I was I was in a hurry. I just, I just We were going to be burying someone in this cemetery, and I just wanted to assess it. And, and he, he was saying that that one that we're talking about, yeah, they're very aware of all the soil there. Yeah. And um, he goes, I just wanted to, I ran there by myself. I ran over to the plot and he goes, and I went through the old section and I know you're not supposed to go across, you know, they say don't walk over a grave and people mm-hmm. have all sorts of superstitions about that. And he goes, well, the real reason is that an old pine coffin, you know, it, 
you go over. He's a pretty big guy, too. He goes, and it breaks. You can go down in. And he goes, that's exactly what happened. He was in a hurry. He was running across. And it went crunch. His legs went down in. And then he said it was like quicksand. Wet. And he was just stuck. He had no cell coverage. And he said he was there about an hour and a half trying to pull himself out. And thank goodness someone came by. And he wasn't stuck there all night. And so now I think about that when I'm running around cemeteries because I get excited. I'm like, well, I want to go take a picture over there and I'll run, you know. Um, But yeah. (laughs) Yeah. um, There is a statue um, of Jesus on a grave that is wearing cowboy (laughs) boots. Can you please explain that one to us? Oh, yeah. I love this. Okay. Over in Paris, Texas, which is a really fun town. Anyway, I really love Paris, Texas. They have a cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery, huge, beautiful, historic cemetery. And there was a guy there named, he's buried there. He's got like a 21-foot monument. And a pretty common Victorian, Victorian era theme for statuary is to show a, uh, usually it's kind of a woman clinging to a cross. And that is um, a reference to the hymn Rock of Ages. Uh, which Def Leppard made a song about later, (laughs) but Rock of Ages. So they have a a line in there, to thy cross I cling. And so um, a lot of uh, funerary art work shows that. Hi, Willet Babcock. He was known around town as being this big, jolly guy. He he had a furniture store, which was also a morgue, because that's what you did back then. Sure. (laughs) You know, this is the late 1800s. Yeah, you know, come on. We're all used to that now, right? And um, he... Um, he made the first opera house in Paris, Texas, and he was really into theater. And people compared him to Falstaff. They said he was just big and jolly, always had a joke. I mean, when I was reading old newspaper accounts, he was easy to track down because he, he left a lot of memories in people's minds. So he commissioned this monument. And what it is, is it's, it's kind of a Jesus, you know, clinging to a cross. And his footwear, he's distinctively got cowboy boots on. And people have theorized what this means. I really think it just shows Willett Babcock's great sense of humor. Um, and also, you know, it, just a reminder that back then, if you had a chunk of change, you came across a bit of money, you thought, oh, I want to plan my, my monument. And then nowadays, we get a chunk of change. We think, I think I'll take a trip to Hawaii, you know, and we kind of right. leave the yeah, headstone yeah. planning up to our family. Like most of the time, people I know, they plan. They're not, not as, I know some people do plan their own headstones and epitaphs and everything but a lot of times it is left up to their kinfolk and it's just a difference you know back then he, he commissioned that from the local um, monument company like you know 12 years or so before he died or something like that so yeah but it's really neat it's very eye-catching and now it's quite a, a bit of a tourist attraction okay so we're gonna open up the phone lines oh, nice. the paranormal radio app phone lines the listener call in line is 855-472-5483 or 85 K G R A. Live and also as a friendly reminder, um, please go to the KGRA radio website and sign up for the Telepath. Um, it is indeed the best in paranormal news. Uh, Ooh, join our good. newsletter, subscribe now, and uh, yeah, it's really great. I subscribed myself, obviously, of course, I would, and um, it's really fantastic. It keeps you up to date in the breast with um, you know, some of the coolest and latest in the paranormal and scientific uh, world of discoveries. So I'm going to take the first call yes. here now, and we're going to welcome Ron. How are you? Hey, Alan. How are you doing? Hello, Tweed. Hi. Hi, Ron. <laughs> um, I, had a, I had a thought. I have a graveyard up at the edge of town on Highway 30 up here at, on my small town. And I live in uh, what we call postage stamp. <laughs> anyway, um, um, in my residence number is 369 residents in the town. Wow. And the graveyard probably has, I don't know, over 100 graves, I would think. Mm-hmm. Just looking at it, and so I walked up there and looked around, and I saw this one family where the whole family was wiped out in the early turn of the century. You know, mom, dad, children. You know, and I don't know if that was like the what Spanish flu or the whatever, um, or the plague or whatever it was in the turn of the century, but I couldn't imagine that many people in this town at that time. Yeah. So anyway, I kept 
I kept looking at some of these uh, grave bridge markers and the dates and the different things. I, I just kept trying to think of, wonder why, you know, why did they die? You know, what happened? And it's really interesting to think about that. And then I started doing a little something. Um, it, it's kind of weird because I, I see activity in my house, which is, you know, right down the road from the graveyard, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I... Uh, not really that scares me, but, you know, just be aware of it. You know, got to be aware of it. And what I do when I drive past the graveyard, whenever I notice I'm driving past the graveyard, I, I try to beat my horn. Hmm. You know, you see, like, hey, how you guys doing? You know, let them know they're still dead. Okay. Hey, they're, they're not forgotten. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, and uh, some, some will actually get up, and I've heard stories about this, about other graveyards, where people have seen people walking around at night. But now if you beat your horn at them when you drive past them, they're going to, oh, wait, I'm still dead. I need to stay here. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's almost, almost like a, um, a, a like a lighthouse of sorts, right? So yeah. Kind of yeah. reminding them, yeah. <laughs> and so if you if you are going by a graveyard and you know somebody might be the caretaker they're taking care of the graveyard and but if you beep and they wave at you and you wave back you know no big deal but you do it out of out of the respect for the people that are there you know supposed to be sleeping they're supposed to be dead and it, and it's not being funny it's it's serious you know and, oh, and yeah. I do see a graveyard I see a graveyard and I try to remember, oh, I got to beat my horn, you know, and I do. And I feel better when I do that. When I don't do that, I notice I have more activity in the house. I've had that happen as well. So, like, when I don't beat the horn and I go past the graveyard, then that night I'll have a weird sound in the house. I'll have some activity in my house that makes no sense, you know, and then I just got to think that maybe they got mad that I didn't beat my horn. <laughs> do you do you think that these spirits or ghosts or whatever know you then at this point? I do, I do. I don't know if they know who I am, or I, I don't think there's any way that I could know who they are unless I I could try to you know have a conversation with them, which I'm not really into that kind of uh, conversation. It's a little scary to me to be speaking with a spirit or a dead person, mm-hmm. you know. So. Um, it, it's just kind of kind of weird to even be thinking about communicating them with, with the horn. But you know, I, I gotta I gotta anticipate in my own mind that it's doing something because I have less activity when I do beat my horn. Well, that, well then it seems like you found a technique. I, I don't know if anybody out there listening has had a, a similar experience, but I would really be curious um, if you if you have. Um, comment on the YouTube or Facebook page live during the show or just email me, alan at paranormalnow.net. Um, and if we get some of those uh, similar techniques or, or stories, um, we'll share them on the air. Thanks, Ron, so much for calling. Do you have yeah, any other questions for Dewey? Thank, thank you very much, Alan. Um, thanks for listening. How how has your experience affected your view of history as you research some of your historical graveyards? There, well, you know. It's really given me a lot of respect uh, for what it would be like to live back then. Like, I, it really puts, to me, I think when I do historical research uh, in his, these historic cemeteries, it brings history to life to me in a way that nothing else does. I mean... I feel much more connected to history. If I'm standing right there and I'm looking at the grave of someone, I go home and look up information about them and I think of all they went through, it it really helps me gain more empathy for them in their time period. So I have a lot more, I think a lot more empathy Mm. for what people have felt in different ages. Because it's easy when you learn history, you just learn facts. This happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. But Mm. when you look into their whole story around, uh, this person. And that's why I wrote the book was to kind of show you all to try and like make you think about all the different things they factored into their life. It wasn't so cut and dry. It wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to join the union. I'm going to join the Confederacy or, you know, just different things like that. Just, or what they went through the choices they had that or didn't have. And just, I feel very lucky to live in this time period, but uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for calling. All right. Thanks so much for calling. Thank you very much. Great show, Alan. And 
Thank you for being here tonight, Dwayne. Yeah, Have thanks. a good night. All right, I good think night, that's Mom. neat that he's very respectful. You know, I think in a way it doesn't matter if you honk the horn. I think it's the fact that he has respectful intentions when he honks a horn. I can imagine mm-hmm. somebody else going by and honking the horn to be a jerk. You know what I'm saying? Like, ha, ha, ha you're dead. I'm not. You know what I mean? And yep. it, that might accelerate things for them. But I think the fact that when Ron honks the horn, he's also feeling, you know, Hey, I remember you, or I, I acknowledge you, or uh, it's sort of respectful. That was my take. Right. Okay. So the phone lines are still open if you want to call oh, in. The number is 85 KGRA Live, 855 472 5483. And it reminded me, Tui, um, I, do this, I do this thing um, when I'm driving, particularly on roads at night, um, and if it's wooded, I will sort of like put my hand out and try to send out a message to any deer or animal Ooh. to just please don't jump in front yeah. of the car. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Uh-huh. And um, knock on wood, uh, that is still, <laughs> it has been effective. Yeah. Uh, because in, in areas where I have family and I, I will drive, um, it's quite common that, to hit oh, a yeah. deer or to have a close call. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. You yeah, have your totally, deer goggles totally, on. Go ahead. It's totally off subject, but um, do you, you know, you're a cat person as well. Do you have um, any belief that, that we can communicate psychically with, with animals? Yes. You do? Oh, totally. Not just animals, but mm-hmm. with na- nature, spirits, trees, uh, elements, water, air, wind, um, I've had a lot of weird things with wind, if if you want, if you don't mind me telling a wind story. I've never heard a wind story, so I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, Like, so this one reason I want to tell it. So I've actually started working on a new book and it's, it's kind of going to just be about all the the weird things that I've had because maybe someone else will help them out because I'm Mm -hmm. always looking, maybe else has had this. Anyway, one of my friends, this was years ago, he died in a motorcycle crash and the internet was kind of a new thing. And I was working in Belgium at the time. And, you know, he lived back in Washington State. So I found out about his death through an email, which seemed really weird. And I I read this email. It was very short and concise and said, you know, blah, blah. He died today, yada, yada. And I read the email and I was like, and then I had to read it again because I just went like, I didn't, must have misunderstood that. Well, it was very clear he died, you know, but it was just. So um, I I was working um, in a multimedia company and it was a cubicle job. And uh, other people would take smoke breaks, but I would take goat breaks. I would just say, I'm going to take a goat break. And everyone thought I was going out to smoke, yeah. but I was actually going out to pet the goats because I thought it's not fair. I don't smoke. I should have breaks too. Yeah. yeah. So, so I was like, wow, totally need a goat break. So I went out and I'm, I'm, there was this little, <laughs> we worked in a, this building, but right next to the building was a little hotel that had this fenced in thing with the goat and the dog and the goat. And I just loved each other. And I would, cause I would bring him like like, lots lots of of nice good grass grass. Mm -hmm. and And so so i'm there there, and i'm just just trying trying to wrap wrap my head head around my friend's friend's death death. and And, um all all of a sudden sudden, the wind wind comes comes up up to me me. (laughs) i know that sounds crazy crazy. and And, uh i feel feel my friend friend. and And he's saying yeah it wasn't it was, it was like, like a knowing. knowing. It was like, it was like here I am. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, wind, the wind came up and stopped. And, stopped. and, 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 and I, felt I felt the consciousness, consciousness next, next to me. To me. Okay. Which I know sounds, sounds crazy. crazy. But, but he was he saying, saying, I'm okay. okay. And, and I, 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 think I think the wind, the wind actually, actually brings, brings messages. messages. This, this is my theory. theory. I think mm-hmm. it exists and it gives us messages. I've had it. Tell me things before I I feel bad that I haven't engaged with the wind more. But... You know, you know when, when, you when you look, look at cultures, around, cultures around, around the world, a lot of them, them have, have names, names for their winds, winds. Okay. like Chiraco, Chinook, Chinook, and, and, and you, you, you visit, visit different parts, parts of the world, and their winds, winds have names. Have names. Anyway, anyway, that was that my was big my wind, wind story. <laughs> so you think that the elements do have some sort of interaction or consciousness uh, with, with with us? Because, uh, you know, you think about the scientific age, right? I mean, there are some things that were once not explainable and are now explainable through yeah. science. And so the conclusion was anything supernatural is therefore explainable by science. And maybe we're coming to a point now where we can try to keep stay rational, but 
uh, keep an open mind to think that, you know, maybe these other things, some of these other um, ha- happenings um, are not explained, you know, by, by conventional science and that they're, they, they could w- well one day be, um, but they may actually be real. Maybe there is some sort of interaction between the elements or uh, what have you. Yeah, I, I've had some experiences with like nature in that regard. And to me, it's, you know, that, that whole wind thing was interesting. I've had, yeah, when I was a kid, I had another thing with the wind. And oh, you were asking about animals as well. Um, I definitely think animals communicate with us all the time. I think, you know, I've heard people like, say things oh i wonder if animals have feelings <laughs> like give me a break have you ever seen how guilty a dog can look i mean how the, oh, the real question is you know when are we going to have enough feelings to understand that i think animals have more feelings they're more heart-centered and really kind of like we are when we're little like one of the i'm very lucky I, I have a lot of memories from childhood and one memory i have is just how strong your heart energy is at that age and how you know you get your feelings hurt so badly because when you're a little kid you're just bursting with all this heart energy and um you know we have to kind of learn to insulate ourselves as we grow up or we're just so thin-skinned but um yeah so um, i kind of forgot where i was going oh but i definitely feel that animals communicate with us i one time my this is going to sound a little weird but my cat that i had before this one Mm -hmm. Um, she was acting, she was meowing and obviously in distress. She was really, uh, fuzzy. She was big, fluffy, little, actually little fluffy black cat. Mm -hmm. And I just, I was asking her over and over, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she was like, meow, meow, and just distressed, which was not like her. And I'm like, what is going on? And suddenly a picture in my head came in my head of her (laughs) trying to use the cat box, but being constipated. I'll just say it like that. And I thought, why did I just get that image in my head? Well, she was constipated, long story short. And mm-hmm. I thought, oh, I, that was interesting. I have not been able to. I mean, I wish I were one of those people who could just communicate all the time with my cat. I mean, she's got me pretty well trained. I know what she means. I understand her a lot. But I'm not saying that I get psychic messages from her. But I do believe that's possible. And I do think that image that came from my cat telling me what was wrong. But I did ask. I asked what was wrong. And I got an image. I guess I was clear enough for that brief instant so <laughs> how about you i have never um but i do suspect that it's possible um i have seen some videos of you know oh, animal yeah. communicators mm-hmm. that are really just inexplicable like what they can do yeah um, they would because you could see the the healing of a relationship in real time um, so, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if you can be a charlatan and, and pull that off, but um, if you are supposedly are as a cat, a cat or animal communicator are brought onto a site um, and then you say, this is the problem, um, cat or uh, big cat or animal, whatever it is. Yeah, I've seen some big cat ones that were amazing. Maybe we yeah. saw some of the same ones where the cat, I mean, I was like, w- there was no reason for the cat to behave that way and come over to this person when, yeah. When it's otherwise withdrawn or aggressive and there's an energy they're picking up there. Um, But then they, you know, will say, like we see with human psychics, right? Um, Well, this cat had uh, some sort of interaction or problem with either um, the previous owner or what what have you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm communicating to the cat that this is a safe place. And then I need you to communicate this to the cat. And then all of a sudden the behavior changes. Um, I, I don't know how you fake that. that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I had a dog once that was chewing everything up and, mm-hmm. you know, my family was like, okay, you know, this is it. We, tomorrow we get rid of the dog. Um, and you know, I talked to the dog and was like, hey, is, you're going to be <laughs> sent away. And she changed and never the next day she hadn't done her usual stuff shredding and they're like well she's got a reprieve for a day and it went on and on and we kept her and she never did it again so i don't know i mean coincidence i mean uh, she might have just might not have been me talking to her maybe she just picked up on the feeling that oh they're gonna get rid of me i don't know what it was but it it was interesting (laughs) not something i can prove no i i believe in the power of symbolism um so yeah, whatever your belief system is and and some people um 
either really do believe in fairies and elementals um, or some you know, sort of celebrate them and what, what they symbolize. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you think that the wind can be a, a form of communication, mm -hmm. um, could there not be other elementals and fairies and that sort of thing? Um, yeah, I have had some experience with like a water sprite and I have had, uh, I had a, I might as well just say it here. I had a tree talk to me once, which was kind of amazing. I was on a meditation retreat. I'll just tell you this one because I hope I can remember what it said. I, I've been wanting to go through my diary and find exactly what it said to me, but I was at this meditation meditation retreat we were doing all these lengthy meditations i mean to the point mm -hmm. where i mean i felt high i went when i was in the bathroom at one point i looked at my eyes and my pupils were huge and we were all just really in this expansive state and so okay i'll i see we're getting close talk top of the hour here I'll, but i'll make it quick so we did this one big thing and, and the lead lady who was running it and i was feeling very skeptical like okay so my pupils are big big deal you know maybe nothing's going to happen she goes i want you to go out in nature for 20 minutes and you know and then come back and so i went out and i climbed a cedar tree now I, i've always been been a big tree climber ever since i was a little kid i love climbing trees climbed way up in this cedar tree and i was i was watching all these creatures on the tree like a a, a moth and a you know a, all sorts of creatures were you know bird and uh, ants caterpillar and i just said um something to this tree i said hey tree you know what what do you ha um you've sure got a lot of life on you and in response i said oh wow why is that or something i can't remember my exact question but it was along those lines i but i did address the tree out loud yeah. all of a sudden i was enveloped in this very paternal love it was like this great big love like i love you little creature like i'm a little creature and it said well when you live up to your true potential you provide shelter for all sorts of life, something like that. And I was just like, whoa, that's true. <laughs> and that came to me from a cedar tree. <laughs> but, you know, and I didn't hear it out loud, but it came through my head. It was one of the neatest things <laughs> that I've experienced right. in my life. But I don't tell people this stuff because, and I've kept it all in, but I'm putting this all in a book because maybe it'll help someone else. But I have kept all this to myself. And I, now I feel like I need to come out of the psychic closet. So I'm uh, here, I'm starting it on your show. <laughs> right. Or not psychic, but the whatever, the weirdness closet. <laughs> no, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think there's definitely something to it. Do you think it could be your own mind sort of utilizing nature as a tool uh, to communicate with itself, with you, like the subconscious working through, um, you know, energy at the top sure. of And yeah. Yeah, I don't claim to really know what anything is. That's, I guess, the, the reason I just feel it coming out, because I thought by now I would have figured out what it is. Like when I was younger, I thought I would, I thought I would figure things out. And I, I haven't figured anything out. So I'm just like, other than who Rope Walker is, hey. One out of a million things in my life. But yeah, woohoo, I figured something out. But beyond that, I haven't figured anything out. But I just want other people to know that they're not alone if they have these experiences. And, um, and that you know, sometimes also... When I go on ghost hunts, a lot of times I hear people talking about elementals as if they're bad. In nature, to me, my experience with nature is always like the most loving, wise. It doesn't feel like it comes from me. I mean, it's way more wise than me. <laughs> um, and But the feeling of love is always very nice. And it just uh, makes you want to care for our planet more. Yeah, absolutely. Tui, thank you so much for yeah, coming you. on again. I, I love chatting with you. Oh, it's so fun. I was having a great time hanging out with you. Thanks so much. And if I'm on again, I'll sometime I'll make sure I have more light. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Oh, no, that's all right. Um, and I'm having audio issues apparently on my side, too. So it's just one of those things. <laughs> um, so where besides TuiSnyder.com, where else would you like people to go to find out more about your works? Oh, well, if they want to drop by my YouTube channel, that's neat. Oh, oh, and if they want to buy my book, my new book is $10 off right now. It's like a huge sale, everybody. Woo -hoo. <laughs> it's six. Yeah, 50 tales of interesting stuff. I, I mean, chapters. Anyway, yeah, so it's on Amazon. Go to Amazon and, you know, check it out. And um, yeah, you can sign up to my newsletter, too. I send one every Sunday, but I sent one today because I wanted people to come to this. So yeah, anyway, I had a blast and this was so fun. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming out of the psychic closet tonight. I, I really appreciate that. I'm really honored. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I was like, you know, this is the show. I think I'll just do it. <laughs> yeah. Is that something that you think you'll develop? or? or try I've to started do? a book and it's just writing itself. I woke up about three days ago and I just designed a cover and I'm like, holy moly. And then I, I started, I have like 17,000 words already. I'm like, oh my mm -hmm. goodness, I can't help myself. Yikes. This, this is coming out. <laughs> it's time. It's coming out. So everybody um, go support. 
two week get her books and uh, look forward to this next chapter in her um, authoring life, I suppose, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, right. everybody. Good night, Tui. Thank you. Bye. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us once again on Paranormal Now on KGRA Radio. I do appreciate you and your support. Thanks for the calls, Ron. As always, um, I appreciate your, um, your great. really good questions, um, always, and, and comments. And yeah, you know, we, we should respect the, the, the dead, right? Um, we, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, what what is going on there, and is that really something that we want to to just take for granted? Um, is that something we want to ignore at um, maybe our own peril? <laughs> oh, who knows? Um, but I think that uh, having respect for the other side, uh, whether you believe in it or not, might just be um, a safe a safe approach. Um, if you're agnostic, if you're uh, an atheist, um, that doesn't mean there isn't something there beyond our death. It may not be something that you can put in a religious box, um, but there might be something there. And I think we need to keep an open mind. So for all of you out there, I hope that you hope that you will keep an open mind moving forward and join us next week at 8 p.m. every Saturday, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you once again to everyone out there living the mystery. Be well.